Good afternoon, I'm Marcus De Silva and welcome to the third instalment of Trust TV, an interactive webinar series that gives you as investors exclusive access to Janice Henderson's Investment Trust Managers and gives you the opportunity to have your questions answered here live in the studio. Now today I'm delighted to be joined by James Henderson and Laura Foll who are co-fund managers on two of Janice Henderson's investment trusts. That's the Lowland Investment Company and Henderson Opportunities Trust. Throughout the program, using the live Q&A facility on your screen, you can ask our fund managers anything you like. From stock selection, to questions about the funds, macroeconomics, what they had for breakfast, whatever it is, please, let's put James and Laura on the spot. Now, before I introduce you to the managers, here is a little background on who they are and the investment trusts they manage. Since the early 1960s, Lowland Investment Company has targeted income and capital growth for its shareholders over the medium to long term. The trust has a mandate to invest across the spectrum of UK equities and has always had a bias towards medium and small size companies, but will typically hold a number of larger household brands. With a market cap of about £410 million and net assets totaling £446 million, the trust has maintained or increased its dividend for more than 40 years and in 2017 paid a total annual dividend of 49 pence per share. Up to 20% of the portfolio may be invested outside the UK, but the number of overseas holdings currently represents around 3% of the portfolio. Lowland uses the FTSE All Share Index as a benchmark, but tends to have a much higher weighting in mid and small cap stocks than the index. The trust has been managed by James Henderson since 1990, with Laura Foll appointed co-manager in 2016. Henderson Opportunities Trust has been trading since 1985, and its sole focus is on growing shareholders' capital. It seeks to outperform its benchmark, also the FTSE All Share Index. And to achieve this, the portfolio managers pick from a wide universe of UK stocks and are unconfined by benchmark weightings. The trust has a market cap of about £88 million and net assets around £106 million. The Trust's NAV and share price total returns in the five years from January 2014 have outperformed the index. James Henderson has managed the Trust since 2007, while Laura Foll's appointment as co-manager came in September 2018. Laura and James employ a mildly contrarian style, which means they invest at the point that a company is out of favour, unloved or simply less well known and therefore covered less by brokers and analysts. Fundamentally, they are bottom-up stock pickers that prioritise value and growth potential and believe that meeting companies on a regular basis gives them a competitive edge. So it's a pleasure to introduce you to James Henderson and Laura Foll. Guys, a very warm welcome Thanks. to you. So let's start, I mean, last week, seemed a busy week for markets. Do you want to explain a little bit about what went on? Yes, it's been an interesting week. So there's been quite a sharp sell-off and within that there's been a, a real rotation in what's doing well. So what we've seen over the last few years is that companies with really good earnings growth has performed well. So growth as a style has worked. But within the last week we've seen quite a sharp rotation. So value actually did quite well within the last week whereas growth sold off. And as value investors, what we do in periods of weakness is we're looking for opportunities. So we've been going down our list of stocks thinking, well, what would we like to add? And um, both me and James have a list of companies and we're just slowly adding to names that we think have sold off just a bit too much. That's interesting. So with a bit of cash, you've, you've actually bought more. Exactly. So we've got scope to invest. The gearing on both of the trusts you mentioned is not anywhere near the peak that it could be. So we have got scope to invest when we see opportunities. Just to give you a few examples, we've invested more in a company like Hill & Smith which is one of our industrial holdings. It does galvanizing and it makes road crash barriers and that sort of thing. It sold off really quite materially from its highs and we felt that was a bit overdone. So we just put a small amount into our Hill & Smith holding. Brilliant, well, let's get on to what the trusts do and importantly, actually, what the difference is between them. What do you think, James? There is very little stock in both trusts. There's very little similarity. In, in Lowland, it's about income growth. So most of the companies, the great majority, are companies that will grow their dividends well in coming, should grow them well in coming years. Whilst we don't have any, that limits the number of companies that are available for you to invest in. Uh, so with Henderson Opportunities Trust, we go right across the market. We don't worry about whether they're paying dividends. If they're a really exciting growth company, they can be in there. So it's, it's a different approach. 
Okay. Um, Laura, do you want to add, add anything to it, sort of like how they, how they, what the differences are between So them? I think the key thing is when I think about the clients, they're quite different. So for HOT, that would be someone that really wants capital growth. So they want to be invested in the companies in the UK. They're really exciting growth companies, and that tends to lead us more down the AIM route. So HOT has almost 60% of its assets invested in AIM. Whereas Lowland, when you're thinking about someone that would be interested in Lowland, it's more someone that wants income growth. So maybe they have a specific goal in mind for that income. They might want to pay you know, the school fees or have a specific holiday in mind. That's what someone from Lowland would want. They would want income growth. And therefore, for Lowland, we try and make that income really predictable for our shareholders. And as James said, that leads us more to companies that are perhaps larger with more focus on cash generation when we're thinking about Lowland. OK, immediate question here. Are there more opportunities in big or small companies? There are always opportunities across the board. There are always failures in companies across the board. And you shouldn't be dogmatic about whether it's big or small. It's usually easier for a small company, let's say a hundred million pound company, to become a billion pound company, go up ten times, than it is for a, a billion pound company to become a ten billion pound company. So there's always a bias to, to work, looking at small companies because that's what will probably drive returns over time. Successful small businesses growing drive returns over time but at the same time the large companies are mature they are they're established businesses you're running less risk holding them so what we're trying to do is blend those less risky stocks with the high higher growth stocks that you get in smaller companies and it's about getting that balance to give consistency hopefully over time okay sure sure um, so let's let's go to your investment style and we often hear value investor, it's something that's thrown around. Warren Buffett's a very famous value investor, and so is his mentor, Benjamin Graham. What do we mean by this? Well, I think value investing is, a, as you're right, it's a very loose, bad word. I mean, do, does anyone buy a stock if they think it's bad value? No, they don't, do they? So every stock, is, you have to believe, is good value. It's your time horizon that matters. I think we are more contrarian. When things are being, you're told that there's a real problem, Often people exaggerate. Things rarely are as bad as you're told. And so if everyone says it's bad, it's there in the share price. The valuation is low. That's when you're a value investor. You're looking because the valuation's low because people are saying it's difficult. And that is often at the bottom. And as perception gets a little bit better, things can get better, share prices can improve. Whilst if everything is very good and you're told how good it is, the last person's bought the share, there's no further person to come in and buy because everyone thinks it's so good, then it can probably only disappoint. So a value investor is looking for more likely to be buying problem stocks. I think that being said, we do need to be careful of companies that don't have any earnings growth or where we can't see where the earnings growth is coming from. So we are value investors, but we try to be very careful to avoid those areas where we think there are structural problems. So for example, in both of the trusts, we hold hardly anything in retailers unless they're very, very specialist or perhaps online is where their focus is because we do see real problems on the UK high street. So we are value investors and we do look for recovery situations, but I would say there's also an overlay of trying to think, was there actually earnings growth here? You know, can we see a path to recovery? Mm. And there's a reason why some companies are, have a low valuation. It's because they're not, they're not great companies, basically. Yeah, exactly. We need to avoid those. And obviously, we won't be successful 100% of the time. But for mm. example, we hold nothing in either of the trusts in tobacco. And we've thought long and hard about that. But actually, we struggle to see where the earnings growth is coming from in those types of companies. Mm -hmm. I suppose in that situation, being a contrarian investor, you could just be wrong rather than being contrarian. So. Um, OK. In terms of uh, the trusts themselves, do you invest in the trusts? Do you have your own money in the trusts? Yes, I've, I've run Lowland since 1990, and I remember buying it early on, I think, it, um, and it, it felt like a, it felt quite painful buying it early on because I, I, I hadn't been working for, for, I was paid less than I'm paid today. It was a big commitment to me, but I'm, I've never got round to selling them, luckily. Um, uh, so I, I've still, uh, uh, and I then became a habit, it became easier to always buy the trust, my, my, the trust I was running than anything else, because I couldn't sell the other things, I was conflicted. So I've always just, if I have any pennies, I buy, and I think it's right, you should always eat your own cooking. 
Yes, yes. so I hold them as well, probably in a lesser scale, but both Lowland and what I've got in my personal account. I find it just easier than, than trying to buy individual stocks to stick with the trust. Yeah, and I, I would assume that it's important for investors, isn't it, that they, they know their fund managers are invested in their own, what they're saying, you know, their strategies. Yeah, I think it gives them some comfort. You know, we meet a lot of investors at the AGM and it's certainly something that people are interested in. Okay, so can we talk a little bit about the split between the two of you and how you both approach your work and the trusts? Yes. So there's no hard and fast split, but I would say roughly we split it along sector lines. So James is really, really strong on insurance and industrial holdings, um, whereas when it comes to perhaps consumer stocks or pharmaceuticals, I would say that would be more where I would specialise. So we very roughly split it along sector lines, but we do try and have it so that we both cover everything so that if one of us isn't here, you know, we know the basics of a company and what they're doing. I think the thing is, if one of us felt very strongly about something, you know, I have a lot of respect for Laura's views, so if she felt very strongly, she, she will get on and do it, buy it or sell it. And the same, I will, if I felt strongly about it, um, it would take a lot to say we wouldn't do it. But most of the time, you don't feel very strongly about things. That's the, that's the, those are the extreme times. A lot of the times in the middle, and there's a consensus uh, happens at, 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 at that time. Um, we don't deal a great deal, um, so there is. If we're really convinced about something, we go. We've got to make it count. But much of the time, we don't feel like that. We feel we've got good, solid holdings, and we follow them. So it's a low turnover approach. As regards smaller companies, it's very good to be looking at us both to be looking at different smaller companies. There are a lot out there. Um, so, but with big companies, we might see them together. Smaller companies, we often go separately. Right. And presumably, low turnover keeps the costs down as well. Yes, the ongoing charge for both we would think are pretty competitive. So, Lowlands, the ongoing charge is just below 60 basis points, and Hot, it's just below 90 basis points, which for a smaller company fund, we think is pretty competitive. I always like the idea of never having to sell. Um, we bought an insurance company, Hiscox, in 1992, and I've occasionally had to trim the holdings. It's got too big for the portfolio, but I've just sat and held it once every six months. I meet the management, and it's been wonderful watching it grow into the substantial company it is today. That's that's the ideal. The trouble is not every company is like that, and we have to make decisions, tougher decisions about some on the way. Now, Ain, you said you've got a lot of these stocks in your portfolios. Um, are they overvalued? I think it really depends. AIM is a very broad market. So there are certainly companies that we look at and we look at the market cap and we look at the sales and we think, oh, well, that, that looks reasonably high. But then there is such breadth in AIM that there are also companies that, when I look at them, I think, well, for the growth, actually, that, that looks pretty interesting. You know, that valuation doesn't look stretched. And that's one of the good things about AIM. You know, there are the diversity and diversity in both types of company and also the valuation. There are new businesses coming up and growing on AIM and it's very difficult to, um, to put a value on some of these businesses. They could be the stars of tomorrow and the, the valuation could look very high today to conventional, in a conventional sense, but if they do come through with the results, then you know they will be a very much a worthwhile investment. A lot won't, but the new successful businesses in the UK will be on will probably be found on in the AIM market, and that's what we must be open to looking for them. When you're sort of looking at you know the large cap versus the smaller mid cap market, is it a very different hat that you have to wear as investors when you're looking at these these two different sizes types? Is it more than just size? I think the investing style is quite different in large cap. Often when you're looking at large cap, you're, you're often trying to second guess what consensus estimates are doing. In other words, what investment banking brokers are thinking is going to happen to the earnings. Whereas with smaller and medium sized companies, it's simpler in a way because you're just thinking, well, what's the earnings growth going to be? You're not trying to second guess people. And in a way, that's what all investing should be. So what matters in large cap over the long term is what matters. Is, is the earnings growth. It's not what happens to consensus and moving around short term. But you can get caught up in that on the short term in looking at consensus estimates for larger companies. 
And you have to remember that when you buy a small cap, you're probably committed to it. You're not going to get to sell it in the same way. So you have to think longer and harder about making a small cap investment. You know, we, and we're not in British American tobacco, but we, you could buy it and change your mind about it. Um, you, if you buy a small company, you're probably committed in the long term, because if it starts to go wrong, you'll have more trouble selling it. That's the risk with small companies. At the same time, the positive side is that it's going to be the, the small company of today will be the large company of tomorrow, and that's the thrill of investment is finding those companies. Hopefully, if they're successful, um, there seem there are. It's a big market. There's lots of small companies. So how do you how do you sift through them all and find good investments? You always be open to ideas. You never know where the next idea is going to come from. It might come from a competitor company. It might come from a large company. It might come from the papers. It might come from broker research. There is no one place it comes from. We now use more screens than we used to to try and see companies that have got potential or what we're looking for. But you should never close your mind just to observation. And I think after that, so after they kind of come in through our filter, we really like to meet the management teams. And I think it's particularly important for the smaller and medium sized companies to meet the management teams because the company can look very good on paper. And then if you meet the management team and you find them not particularly impressive, I think that does matter for small and medium sized companies because there's not many people running them. Whereas if you meet you know, Glaxo or HSBC, it might not be that helpful to meet the CEO because there's a lot of people underneath them actually running the business. But that's not the case in small and medium sized companies. The CEO and the CFO, they really matter. Got another question from the audience here. Given the political problems facing the UK at the moment, are you tempted to allocate a greater proportion of Lowlands assets to Europe? We always look at Europe. Um, but I think there's enough going on in the UK. There are over 1,200 stocks on AIM. And some of, them, some of them will be the bigger company of tomorrow, for instance, but they will, they will be able to grow because of the excellence of their product, their excellence, their management. And all the political noise is irrelevant if you've got a real good product, you really work hard to look after your client. You'll get through to the other side. It's about having that product. It's about having the management team that's got the vision to see ways through problems. So to a certain extent, you shouldn't be listened to the political too much. You should pay attention to the companies. What's the company actually doing? What's pay attention to to the to the management teams? Are they going to be are they the people kind of people are going to be able to react, react to whatever is thrown at them? And to do that, I think we will stay committed to the UK predominantly for the portfolio. There's enough opportunity here and the valuations here are, are lower in the UK than they are in other major markets. That's been, a, that's been the result of the difficulties and the political noise that's out there. But out of that noise, those problems will be opportunity. Yeah, I think that's right. I think given that we go all the way down the market cap scale, the breadth of opportunities that we've got just in the UK, I think moving to Europe as well might prove to be a bit of a distraction. Um, and we'll just focus on the UK, and there's a lot of opportunities there. OK. Um, you know, small cap stocks are, tend to be very volatile. So how, and this presumably it feeds into the trust share price. So how do you, how do you sort of deal with that volatility? We run a long list. So we've got um, 100, um, more than 100 holdings. In um, Lowland, we've got 90 holdings in Henderson Opportunities Trust. So you need a long list, particularly when you're buying problem companies that might be perceived to have problems, and those problems are being over exaggerated. Um, we see often buying that type of company. Um, therefore, some of them will, those problems will be very real and will have underestimated them. Every, and that will happen every so often. But quite often, those over exaggerated problems, and the company comes in with good trading, you're, you're in a, you're, you'll see share price appreciation. Um, but you do need a long list to do that. And we don't run short lists in small companies because it'd be too risky. We need to be running relatively long lists. How long are we talking here? Well, as I say, I've never taken it over 130 holdings, um, but I've got into the 120s. Um, and Lowland, that's with Lowland, with Henderson Opportunities, it'll be between 80 and 90 holdings. 
we're just we're just we have been a bit over that up to 100 but not more so it's a little bit more concentrated in henderson opportunities um and the other but for lowland i need the long list in, in smaller companies so if any one of them cuts their dividend or more than one cuts their dividend the overall distribution still grows because the other the other 100 are growing their dividend um, and that, that, that dividend growth as i say is all important the long list helps protect that dividend growth Classic portfolio theory. Okay, we've got another question uh, from the audience here. Considering the latest market turmoil and your exposure in financials and industrials in Lowland, will you reconsider the industry breakdown? I think uh, I go first on that. I mean, on the financials, th there isn't a lot in banks. The banks are international, that we're, where we're holding a bank, so it's it's HSBC. Um, so that won't be that won't be too affected by any problem in the U problems in the UK economy. Actually, our international holdings, uh, our, our industrial holdings, are big international companies often, um, and they are the companies that have benefited, that have been benefiting, for instance, from sterling weakness. I, I think the industrial weakness in the industrials is an opportunity um, because the global economy is still growing. The growth of the global economy is surprising people. Um, the sell-off is. It, it, people are predicting a slowdown that isn't as may, they may be over exaggerating and that is an opportunity to add to one or two of the industrials as Laura was saying. Yeah, I think when you look at our sector breakdown as well it can be slightly misleading in that it looks like we are very heavy in financials and industrials but within that actually the diversity is really quite high so for example in industrials just taking Lowland for a second we have something like Johnson Service Group which does textile rental in the same sector as you know, Avon Rubber, which makes gas masks for the US DOD, you know, Senior, which does aerospace engineering. So it looks like one large sector, but actually the end market exposures in industrial are all quite different. And as James mentioned, our financials holdings tend to be insurers rather than banks. So I would be a little bit wary about just looking at our top-down sector positions, because they don't necessarily tell you that much about the underlying market exposures that we've got. Okay. Just going back to what we're talking about volatility, is, it, is there any advice that you have for investors on how to deal with volatility? Well, I, I think the best way to, is to invest regularly. Like we were talking about earlier about how I've built up my shareholding in Henderson's by not trying to time my, per, it, my shareholding in Lowland and in Henderson's opportunities, not by trying to time the, it is when I've got some pennies are available, I buy the shares regardless. So I never have any money in the bank cash, I just buy shares if I um, if I do see myself with any money. And I think pound cost averaging is the best way of, of building holdings like that. So that's a regular, a monthly, regular amount monthly amount of exa Exactly that. Don't try and call the markets. It's too difficult. Too many highly paid people are spending their time doing that. Just invest regularly and then you'll get both, you'll be buying at, at when it's difficult to buy. When it, when it hurts to buy, if it's done regularly, you'll be buying on those days, and those will usually be your most worthwhile investments. Mm -hmm. OK, good. The discount uh, on um, Henderson Opportunities Trust, so this is the share price relative to its net asset value. It's been widening a little bit this year. Why do you think this is? I think it's a mixture of reasons. So you're right, Henderson Opportunities Trust is trading at a mid-teens type discount to its net asset value. And I think that's partly because it is focused on the UK and it is difficult being a UK fund manager at the moment. Um, as we've seen from some of the questions, you know, there is a lot of concerns about politics, about Brexit, and that means that a lot of the investment trust sectors that are focused on the UK are at discounts. So if you look at the UK equity income sector, UK all companies, UK smaller companies, these are all trading at a discount to net asset value as a sector and hot falls within UK all companies. So, so I think that's part of the reason. Part of the other reason is that it's quite rational to have a small discount for liquidity. You know, given that HOT has roughly 60% holdings in AIM, there should be a slight discount in asset value for that reason. So if you, if you look at the long-term discounts, really, with certain asset classes, you get an idea of where they normally trade, is that correct? Yes, but HOT would be at a, a higher discount than it has been historically, um, partly because of that Brexit political uncertainty that I mentioned. I think putting in some historical perspective discounts, you can worry about them too much. Um, I've run Lowland and it, sometimes it's been on a 17 discount and it's been on 11 premium. 
there's nothing particularly rational about discounts. They come and they go. It's, you're, you're, it's best to probably be buying when there's a bit of a discount because it, sometime out there it, it disappears. So you get these swings. Um, as an investor, as, as the investment manager, all you can do is keep explaining what the trust does, explain the story, make work so that, and make sure that dividend's growing. Um, and then the discount looks, will look after itself. So I'm, I'm dubious that um, worrying about it adds any value. Worry about your investments. Worry about the companies you're in and, not, and blank everything else out. Okay, good. Another question from the audience here. Is it the end for the high street for Asylum posted £4 million in losses today? Very pertinent question. I think we've got to be very careful about particularly apparel retailers that don't necessarily have anything unique about them. Uh, so we have very little in that area. The only one we do have in Lowland to our detriment has been Mosspros, which is my fault. That's one of the suit retailers. We thought suits were specialist enough that people would still want to go to the high street, you know, get measured for a suit, get one that fits properly. And actually they have been hit along with a lot of other retailers by people just not going to the high street as much. You know, footfall has been really quite weak and they've been hit by that. So we don't hold a great deal in retailers. Um, I don't see that changing. I think we do have long-term structural concerns with the exception of a few specialists. Yes, yeah, so one of the things about seeing next to Laura, you saw that online was growing. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. Um, the, you, you can, the online is now, is, is still on growing at a, at a rate that is making bricks and mortar retailers is a big challenge. Um, that said, if you're, if you're a specialist, if you're offering something that's good enough, you will get retail people will come to you so you know we got we are looking at them it's we're avoiding um, going and committing too much too quickly but you know something like Hulford's is is a possibility for the trusts going forward we need to do more work but they're a bicycle shop you need you probably want to try the product you want to see the product there are going to be opportunities and it's wrong to say the high street's dead the high street's not dead it's just evolving into something different and we're not quite sure what that's going to look like but it will it, it will have to be they'll have to recreate some excitement on the high street to get people back um, but there, there are a lot of clever people thinking about that and there will be a way forward and we need to sit, try and work out who the winners are going to be in that. Mm. One show we do have there is Shoe Zone. Um, again, that, that it may be fine, it, 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 companies need to find a formula that works in, um, at, at the moment and it, that, that, there are, will be examples of that. Okay, let's look to the income in Lowland. It's managed to maintain or grow its dividend for 40 years so there must be a bit of pressure not to let that record slip presumably yes and what's good about the investment trust structure is that we have the revenue reserve so we have roughly two-thirds of a year's payout in lowland sat in the revenue reserve so if we did come to a period where earnings look like they're under pressure um, we're not in that situation at the moment but if if we did approach that then we have that revenue reserve that we could dip into to smooth that dividend growth okay um, how difficult is it to get a balance between growth and income? I, th I think <clears throat> they're not separate pots to me at the end of the day. A company, every company's got to grow. Companies don't just stay still. And if you're not growing, before long you're declining because you'll always have customers that are leaving you. You've always got to be putting on new customers. You've always got to be reinventing yourself a bit or you decline and disappear. So first and foremost, we are growth matters. Growth is where you start. If you don't believe something's going to grow, you shouldn't be involved. But successfully growing companies, after a while, generate cash, throw off cash. And that cash is, is what pays the dividend. So there are, they are the same thing. Successful dividend growing companies are successful growing companies over time. Um, so start with, the, is this business going to grow? Is it going to be a bigger business in 10 years' time? What kind of demands of cash is it going to need to achieve that? And if and it will be a successful dividend stock, if it can grow without consuming all its cash for, uh, in, over, a medi over the medium term, and that cash comes out in the form of a dividend to shareholders, 
I like companies that pay those dividends to shareholders because it stops them wasting the cash on bad projects. So a growth, growth, sensible growth is what we need. OK, we've got another, another question from the audience. Why are you persevering with Green King? Seems like a loser. Well, I don't know if he's been to a Green King pub recently. Um, I, I, I think it's, there's, it's a very, it's a well-managed estate. There is problems in the pub sector. Pubs are closing the whole time. Um, the rise of the coffee shop has put pressure on pubs. Um, but the close, but pubs are closing. There will come a point when the equilibrium is, is reached. Um, the product is good. It's well, uh, 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 it really is good. Um, and the, um, the quality of the asset is very real. Um, and yes, the, this is, there, is a, there is a downturn at the moment, but I think it's, this is a company that's going to be around in 10 years' time, still providing good drink, good and, and a place where people will want to go. You can't, you, you know, you're not going to, the internet isn't going to undermine what a pub offers in the medium term. Sure, sure, sure. OK, we've got to get on to the dreaded B word, which is Brexit. Laura, thoughts? It's a difficult one. I think what the best we can do is picking companies with management teams that really know what they're doing, that are really experienced. So when it comes to exogenous stocks like Brexit or maybe US tariffs or an oil price rise, you know, picking management teams that have kind of been there, done that, and really can manage the business through, you know, hopefully to the other side, and then with good prospects for growing earnings. I think that is the best we can do because it will affect different companies that we own in all sorts of different ways and unpredictable ways. And ultimately, it's the management teams that will be in charge of that. Um, so that's the, the kind of strategy that we've adopted for it. OK, well, final question then. What's your outlook? Small, mid, large, what are your thoughts? There are always a lot of opportunities. And if you're not seeing them, you're just not working hard enough. Um, and you, there will be noise, there will be political problems, there will be ups and downs in the market. But focus on the companies, pay attention to the companies um, and make sure you've got more winners than you have losers by paying that attention. And that gets, in the medium term, where are we starting? Are we in a bad place at the moment? In the medium term, we're not. Valuations are relatively low. Dividends are good. And dividend, therefore, in time, dividend growth will make equity investment, in my view, um, a desirable thing to do. Do you know what, we've got one more question from the audience before we go. Are you worried that the UK doesn't have a more vibrant tech sector in which to invest? Yes, I wish it did have. It's coming through and in, hopefully in Henderson Opportunities Trust we are tapping into that. Uh, there is a lot of good tech in the UK. It's not always in the tech sector. We've got a large holding in Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce has got amazing technology in there. Um, the development of the trend engine over the years. In some, a company like British Aerospace, which is in Lowland, again, there's extraordinary technologies in there. Um, so there is tech, but uh, yeah, there isn't enough of it. Yeah, I think that's right. I've actually been surprised looking at HOT, though, Henderson Opportunities, as to how many smaller tech companies there are. And that's one of our biggest sectors in Henderson Opportunities is tech. But you're right, in Lowland, it is more of a struggle to find exciting larger companies specifically in the technology space. Guys, it's been really interesting. Thank you so much for joining me today in the studio. Thanks very much. And thank you for joining us. We hope you found some useful insight in today's discussion. Now, apologies if we didn't get to any of your questions. If you would like them answered, then please send them through to investment.trust at JaniceHenderson.com and James and Laura will respond as soon as they are available to do so. A recording of this episode will also be available shortly on the Trust TV tab of Janice Henderson's Investment Trust homepage. For more information about Henderson Opportunities Trust or Lowland Investment Company, you can visit their websites at the addresses below. But until next time, goodbye.